Uh, so you're all very welcome to this small practice information session. I'm joined uh, today by uh, Liam Gudera and uh, Bill Holohan, uh, who are going to talk to us about mediation. So today's session is going to be, we're going to discuss what is mediation, how does it integrate with litigation, when is the best time to use me mediation, and how is it works best practice. So you're very welcome. And uh, I'm joined by Bill Holohan, who's the senior counsel and council member here at the Law Society and has a, 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 a two pages of uh, educational attainment uh, of which I could only dream of so Bill uh, very impressive and I'm also joined by uh, Liam who's a partner in Mason Harris and K uh, Mason Hayes and Curran and is uh, part of the dispute resolution team practicing in commercial education and has uh, experience acting for two former Taoiseach and has been an advocate in many courts of inquiries administration and tribunals so you're very welcome today uh, thanks for joining us if anyone would like to ask us a question we'll take it on the chat but over to you Bill well, and Liam and myself, are, as you can see from the fact we both have grey hair, I've been around a while in this game. Uh, so we're well used to mediation and we're, we're devotees and practitioners. But Liam, you know, for colleagues who haven't ever practiced or had experience in mediation, uh, how would you explain what mediation is and how it fits into the litigation process? OK, thanks, Bill. Yeah, I mean, the way I like to think of it is as a facilitated negotiation. So I think that mediation is, if you like, negotiation brought to another level where you have a skilled intermediary whose job or challenge it is to basically bring the parties together to explore the strengths and weaknesses of their cases to try and discern where if you like the path to a resolution might be and then to bring them along that path and sometimes it would be a question of if you like enlightening them or kind of, you know, encouraging them to come along with him or her. And sometimes it can be a case of, you know, almost bullying them or making them kind of face up to certain realities. But it, it's a very unique process. And I think it's something that everyone has to experience before they fully understand it. I think it's always a challenge to explain it to clients. And I think even lawyers can sometimes struggle to understand what it is. And sometimes I think it's probably easier to say what it's not. So what mediation does not seek to do is it doesn't seek to adjudicate. So it is absolutely not an arbitration. And it's amazing how many people, and that includes lawyers, confuse the two concepts and they say, oh, well, how will the mediator decide this? Or let's send it to a mediator for a binding determination. So I mean, that, that is absolutely not the role of the mediator. The role of a mediator is not advisory. So the mediator isn't there to kind of counsel both sides and say, well, actually, that aspect of your claim, I think, is misconceived. And I think, you know, you should frame it in another way. Sometimes a mediator will be asked to give an opinion and sometimes a mediator may gently do that. But essentially, they're not there, if you like, to be a second string of advice to the participants. And then the last thing that mediation certainly isn't is adversarial. So a mediator can't allow it to become a contest where they're somehow an umpire, be they passive or interventionist. Um, and um, I think that, that that then is the challenge of mediation. It's described as alternative dispute resolution. But, you know, I saw uh, an article recently in the UK legal press, and it, it had an eye-catching headline, and it was the death of ADR. And I said, oh my goodness, the death of ADR, like what, what happened that we didn't hear about? But the point was that it's no longer alternative. It is intrinsically a part of dispute resolution. And I know we'll try and come back to this, Bill, but you cannot run litigation now without at some stage actively engaging with mediation. So any practitioner who is in the area of dispute resolution must engage in mediation. And I think once they do, they'll find what a wonderfully dynamic process it is. Yeah, uh, your comment there reminded me about when you said about some people not understanding what, what it was like. A few years ago, we ran a session in Cork uh, at a lunchtime, lunch and learn about mediation. We brought along a senior practitioner who would have been fairly traditional in his ways as a litigator, but he had been to a mediation for the first time. And he gave one of the shortest, most succinct speeches in favour of mediation I ever heard. Uh, and I'll quote it in full, because what he said was, I was very iffy about this mediation now, but you know what? It worked. Thing got sorted. The client was happy. I got a great fee. 
Everyone, everyone happy. And it's that tremendous applause. There you go. Um, so it is, you know, it is something that people uh, need to understand about. A ringing endorsement. And and I heard of another colleague of ours up the country who said that he thought ADR stood for awful drop in revenue. So, you know, you have... Like, I'm saying, a, a lecture for a different food. day. Yeah, Two a lecture for a different day, but, uh, yeah. you know, the, if, you, if you can solve something in six weeks rather than six months or six years for a client, the gratitude curve is high and you can get a lot better return on your, on your hourly investment I think. Uh, in, ter- in terms of fees. I think uh, that's right. And Bill, I mean, you know, I sometimes think one of the key things in mediation, and it's, and it's something you're often asked by clients, is, look, when is the best time to mediate? You know, do we do it right at the very get-go, or do you do it, you know, the week before you go to trial? So what, what has been your experience of that? Well, there's no best time to mediate. The important thing is to actually consider it or to, to do it. Um, under the Mediation Act 2017, now there's an obligation under Section 14 that people, of course, are absolutely well aware of, um, that they have an obligation to advise the client in writing about the advantages and the benefits of mediation before issuing proceedings. Now, when the bill was being uh, debated, I and others made the point that you, you're going to get the Friday afternoon call. The statute is ending at five o'clock this evening in effective terms. You need to issue and you can advise afterwards. So you can uh, issue now without filing a declaration. But the solicitor must file a declaration in the proceedings declaring that they have advised. And if they're to do that, they need to understand it. They need to provide information about what mediation is, its advantages, the benefits, uh, give a list of mediators uh, who will be capable of, of dealing with the situation. And I've had cases where I've managed to stop proceedings going ahead because the declaration wasn't filed. And in one case, a solicitor admitted in court on the DAR that she hadn't advised the client before issuing proceedings. Now, in the normal course, you can go back, you can start again. But in that particular case, it was now going to be a statute bar claim. So for failure to do what they ought to do, they were facing a potential negative action by the clients against them. Yeah. And, you know, so th- that's something that people need to be conscious of. But you need to be conscious not to do it too early because unless you're clear what the actual dispute is, and sometimes you can get a letter of claim in and not really know what the nature of the claim is, you, it might have to wait until such time as you have the statement of claim uh, or the civil summons, uh, or the claim notice of the district court or the civil bill, as the case may be, and the defence before you can try and narrow down what actually is at odds. What I find as a mediator is that if I have a chat with people before the mediation day itself, sometimes we can, you know, in, in a chat between colleagues, you can say, well, look, what's the real beef here? What's the real story? Yeah. Uh, and that helps to narrow it. Um, yeah. but the majority, in my experience, after the pleadings have been uh, trashed out, you're clear what it is yeah. uh, all about. Sometimes discovery sometimes when it's in court yeah yeah and i think that sometimes you know a trap that a lot of practitioners fall into is leaving it too late and if you like doing it almost as a perfunctory um you know i have to do it and gosh the trial is on next month we better have a mediation and i mean what what has been your experience of of that type of mediation then as a mediator i mean do you discern that in the kind of demeanor and manner in which they approach the mediation yeah the, it, and it, it's unhelpful because it there's no real commitment it, it's more a sense of obligation you have to be able to tell the judge that we've been there done that ate that pizza had the the video uh, so that they can tick the box that they've been good boys because there are cost consequences if somebody doesn't uh, contemplate mediation or unreasonably refuses under section 21 of the act um you know somebody could be penalized for not uh, considering mediation so there is that uh, cost consequence but in, in you, you know in your experience what kind of cases are going to mediation okay so i mean i i have to say i find well first of all i i absolutely believe every case is suitable for mediation the most unlikely cases you might think of um and i think that okay the current trend certainly um post covid is there has been pretty well an explosion in uh, demand for mediations because as you know there wasn't uh, a functioning court system throughout much of the pandemic and mediators made themselves available and I think probably counterintuitively everybody assumed that mediations had to be held in real time but remote mediations worked very well so I think mediation has come on to the, the, the kind of radar now of of everyone and and people are looking for it and asking 
um, you know, why, why can't we send this to mediation? And, you know, to that end, I mean, the, the, the beauty of it is its flexibility. So, I mean, once the parties come to us with a genuine commitment, they can devise a mediation that suits what they're about. So I've seen all kinds of variations on that, where you've had kind of breakout rooms where you have two experts discussing quantum in one room, two experts discussing liability in another room, maybe a couple of tax lawyers somewhere else trying to work out that. The mediator moving between them saying, okay, so have we made any progress on that? Is there any common ground here? Uh, and probably the best example, personal example I've had of, if you like, an unlikely candidate for mediation was a case we took against the state relating to trafficking in the fishing industry. And we were trying to bring about um, legislative reform and, and the case began as a, as a JR. And then we were looking for an injunction to stay a scheme. And there were five defendants, five state defendants. And then there was an appeal to the Court of Appeal. And somewhere along the line, um, we had the idea of why don't we refer this to mediation? And I remember my counsel saying, we'll never get anywhere with this. But to make a long story short, we had a retired judge who fitted the role very well because he engaged with the state defendants very well. And we ended up with a comprehensive agreement after two days of mediation, where not alone did we have a settlement of the litigation, but two of the state defendants devised a protocol where, you know, as to how they would handle these applications. Terrific process could never have been delivered through a court. So, I think that has to be the starting point. I think we have to say, look, you know, there surely must be a way here that this could be successfully mediated. And even though we're now obliged to do it, I think we have to approach it in a constructive manner and say, you know, I think we can actually crack this nut. I think I think we can get a resolution here. Yeah. I mean, from your description, you, you described kind of high value cases. In your experience, is it only high court cases we go to mediation? No, no. It is can, there be can be anything, can be anything. So from the voluntary pro bono type case to, you know, the most complex commercial court dispute. I mean, uh, last year I mediated a number of cases involving um, legal costs, so solicitor's costs. So something that wouldn't have occurred to me personally, where the state claims agency now actively welcomed that. So where you have complex cases involving significant costs. They could be in a tribunal, they could be in a medical negligence case. And as a way of bringing, if you like, opposing legal costs accountants together and trying to find the middle ground, they work, they work very well. Um, just one thing, Bill, as you mentioned about, you know, costs, consequences, and the fact that under the Mediation Act, you know, solicitors are obliged to consider it. There's a very interesting High Court judgment, which was delivered only in February by Judge Toomey, and um, it's called Word Perfect Translation Services and the Minister for, for Public Expenditure. But in that case, the judge examined the cost order that should be made. And I mean, everyone will know that cost orders now are becoming much more sophisticated. And just because you win doesn't necessarily mean you get 100% of the cost. So you can have adverse cost orders in relation to certain aspects of the case. But in that case, and I'll just, I'll just quote you one line from it. Um, he looked at how each side had conducted the litigation and he said, in many cases, it will be difficult to see how a party could have conducted the case in the most cost effective manner possible if it did not consider mediation. So straight away, you're on the backward foot if you have not proactively sought mediation on behalf of your client. And if on the other side, you've refused it, you better have a good reason as to why you did that. And there are good reasons but they need to be well thought out and articulated. Yeah. Donald Pinchy, when he was in the High Court as well, gave a decision a few years ago where after an 11-day hearing, uh, there were about 10 different grounds or elements to the claim. And he basically said, look, you should have settled on nine out of 10. Uh, I'm only get, going to give you one day's costs of hearing of the 11 days. Yeah. So economically, it was a, a washout for failure to engage properly yeah. in resolution. Yeah. Um, and also, when you talk about state defendants, I actually was involved in a mediation dealing with the revenue. Uh, now, it wasn't about taxes, about liquidators' fees. Um, 
but it was the first time it had ever gone to mediation. So, you know, the, the, even the old dinosaurs like the state are willing to, to look at that. Oh, yeah, so, for sure. In terms of the mediators, then, you mentioned a retired judge. Who, in your experience, makes for the best type of mediator? Is it is that character trait or is it a qualification? I, I think it's character trait, really, more than qualification. So, you know, I think I think a lot of people fall into the trap of saying, OK, so I have a landlord tenant dispute. Now I want to find a mediator who has absolute expertise in landlord tenant law. Now, I mean, that's fine if it's an arbitrator you're looking for, because there you do want a genuine expert with with industry or sector experience, but but not for a mediator. There are a number of mediators. I mean, there are any number of mediators now, as you know, who are, um, you know, have some kind of qualification. In terms of non-lawyer mediators, I mean, I've tried to use them a couple of times. People like accountants or engineers who have some, if you like, technical background or, you know, who you think would have the people skills to manage it. I think without being chauvinistic about it, a lawyer, it's hard to beat the legal skill set you know, properly applied. So I think all things being equal, it has to be a lawyer. But, you know, there's an interesting phenomena, and I just kind of referred to it there a, a few minutes ago, of ex-judges. We have a number of ex-judges now who are looking to practice actively as mediators. And I think some of them, you know, are terrific. But again, I just caution that kind of default thinking where you say, well, I'm going to mediation, um, because I'm not really that pushed about it, but I have to do it. So do you know what? It'd be a great idea to have an ex-judge because, you know, that's the next best thing to a hearing. That'll impress the client. I think it works with certain kind of parties. I think state parties may be particularly deferential to former judges, but it doesn't work with everyone. And sometimes even judges don't have, if you like, the personality skills that are needed. So... For me, you know, I think I think it does come down to the mediator. I mean, Bill, you know from your experience as a mediator and as a practitioner. I mean, what do you think are the personal skills that a mediator needs? I, I think it's it's personal courses, and you know, um, I remember a number of years ago, I, I had a dispute between three insurance companies, and uh, I was trying to persuade the in-house lawyers for two of the insurance companies that we should go to mediation on this because the, the, the plaintiff who was claiming was basically going to blame all three insurance companies that were involved. And they said, oh, we need an expert senior counsel. And by that, they meant barrister rather than solicitors uh, in insurance law. And I said, no. I said, this is a case about a guy who, I won't go into the detail of the case, uh, but it, uh, this is all about building empathy with some, a man who's dying and who's made a claim to insurance companies. Uh, you need an empathic mediator. You don't necessarily need somebody skilled in insurance law. Um, and they eventually saw the point and we ended up with a non-lawyer because the guy was able to build trust with a very sceptical plaintiff. So it, it depends on the nature of the dispute. You look at it, you, you see what's the best type of person to deal with this. If you're going to have a difficult character in the room, you might want a reasonably strong, forceful mediator who can stand up and say, well, hang on a second, you know, behave yourself. Uh, I, I had a mediation one time where I was warned by one side that the individual on the other side would storm out in a temp temper tantrum. Uh, the individual was their brother. Uh, and I said, he's 52, but he behaves like a 15 year old. And that's exactly how he behaved. And I had to try and relate to my then 15 year old middle son. Uh, you know, how would I handle him at home? I know. Uh, and, and that was what, what worked. So it, the preparation for the day is vitally important. I mean, you mentioned earlier about people going to mediation as a tick box exercise, particularly just before trial wrong approach as a practitioner if you're going to go to mediation on behalf of a client you need to plan very carefully for the mediation because you're not trying to persuade a judge or an arbitrator that you're right you're trying to persuade the other side and you should be trying to use the mediator to sell your argument in a neutral non-threatening as you said non-adversarial way so it is very much down to a question of preparing carefully for the, the mediation day and how you approach it and as a mediator as well you know sometimes having a joint session at the start, the group hug, as I call it, um, is not a good idea. No. A, number years, a number of years ago, I was giving a talk to a master's program in, in uh, Maynooth, 
and I was describing the, the mediation process of the day. I talked about the, the you know, gen, generally people think that you have to start with a group hug at the start of the day. And when we broke for coffee, an American who was on the course came up and said, can I ask you a question? Um, you mentioned starting the day with a group hug. How do parties in conflict react when you ask them to hug each other? <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back and explain the euphemism that I just made to get getting together. Now, sometimes yeah. it's appropriate, but sometimes it's not. You keep people apart and you'll shuffle between them. No, I see very few mediations now beginning with plenary session. I have to say, I think I think the trend is against it. And yet, I think for some plaintiffs, it can, it are plaintiffs, I think more than defendants, it can be very important to kind of have their say um, if you like, eyeball the other side, because of course, a lot of mediations, the parties don't engage with each other at all but you know again i think it, it goes back to what we said you know about other topics that you know it's no one size fits all and and that's the great strength and unique characteristic of mediations and i think the skill then for practitioners is to choose the the, the correct mediator you know to pick to pick the person with the appropriate skill set and then, and then the mediator, if they're a good mediator, will be multi-geared, you know, will have four or five, you know, different, you know, gears on them as to how they react to particular types of personalities or particular types of situations. And, and on you go. J just one small maybe tip on that, and I know you and I have spoken about this before, Bill, you know, I think it's a mistake that people make when they're starting out in the mediation and say, OK, let's have a mediation. Let's pick a mediator. I write to you, Bill, and I'll nominate three people. You write back to me, you nominate three other people. And then whatever else we do, we're not going to agree any of those six. And now we're picking off on the on the on the outskirts. I mean, I don't know what you do, but I mean, I would pick up the phone to my colleague and I'd say, listen, you should mediate this. Now, who do you think might be a good mediator? Or do you know, I think X or Y might be. And I find three times out of four that works. And, and we'd hit on someone that we're both, we're both happy with rather than ending up with a compromise that probably neither of us knows. Yeah, very much so. And again, you know, an important part of it is not just the uh, mediator being able to establish a rapport and build a trust with the clients, but with the lawyers. And yeah. if you do what you just suggested. And, uh, you know, both lawyers trust the mediator you're halfway to easing or greasing the wheels for the, the process already. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a much better way to go than, you know, the, the traditional route for choosing an arbitrator. You put up a list of three and you ask the other side to choose and they come back with their three and then yeah. you ask them to intervene. Uh, so you're quite right. Uh, it, it's very important. Can, can I ask a question there just around the typical format for a mediation? Like what are the questions that the mediator would ask and when you, around the selection of the mediator also? You'd want to understand how it how a mediation is put together? Like what happens in the first hour, the first 10 minutes, first, you know? Well, as I, said, I mentioned earlier, you might have the group hug to get both people together, uh, where there's a bit of uh, posturing and people set out their positions, their expectations. Um, if you're going to have a, a joint meeting, generally what you'll do is you'll welcome people and uh, you'll thank them for coming to mediation, for having made the commitment to do it. Uh, you outline uh, how the day is going to unfold. You generally sign the mediation agreement, the agreement to mediate there and then on the day. That's an important milestone because confidentiality only attaches under Section 10 once the mediation agreement or agreement to mediate is actually signed. It might be, be signed off beforehand or agreed beforehand, but it's no harm to have a little bit of ceremony around that at the start. And then uh, you usually say, look, we'll go into, into caucus sessions uh, and I'll have a private chat with each side. And an important part of it is that everything that happens in a private session is completely confidential. Nothing gets revealed as to what went down there without that party's express consent. So at the end of a private session, I would say to somebody, okay, what are the takeaways from this? What can I now mention or what can I say or uh, what can I discuss with the other side based on what we've talked about? Um, and as a mediator, it's very important to keep track of that because breach of confidentiality can get you in, in trouble. Uh, but what you do is you're a bit like Humpty Dumpty with legs long enough not to fall off the wall. But you're looking over the wall at both sides and both sides tell you what their cards are. It's not like round hall poker where you're trying to guess when they say they'll only take X. Is that really the bottom line? And the mediator will get to see in the different rooms what the positions are, see if there's common ground. And then subject to the limitations and disclosure that the parties give them, they can try and guide people towards the common ground. Um, so that's generally speaking how, how it would unfold yeah. uh, 
And maybe cool. just add one one adjunct to that, Bill, um, that, you know, even before the mediation begins, Justin, the mediator would engage with both sides. And, and that's something that's really important. And I think a lot of mediators weren't doing that. And what that does is it breaks the ice. It means the mediator understands completely what each side is about, what they're looking for. And then on the day, they hit the ground running. So you don't have this nonsense where a mediator comes into the room and says, oh, you're John, no, sorry, you're Joe, and you're the plaintiff, oh, no, you're the defendant. And then it's lunchtime before the first offer is made. So that's very important to gain the trust of the parties and to make the process as streamlined and as efficient as you can. So is, is that a process that happens prior to the first meeting? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes there would be there could be three or four engagements like that where the mediator would speak to each side at least once and probably double back to them. Yeah. I generally like to have a joint session with the lawyers beforehand to just review the mechanics of date, uh, et cetera, make sure everybody understands where we're going and then have one to ones with the lawyers and possibly then with the lawyer and the client um, so that, you know, you're, you're up to speed and sometimes uh, the parties will put in position papers where they could, they brief the mediator on what uh, they want the mediator to know. Some of that will be your eyes only as mediator. Some of it will be for disclosure to the other side. Um, but the, the, a couple of years ago, there was one of the more recent import large foreign firms was involved in the mediation where I was mediator. And uh, I got a buzz from the reception and the office of the Capel building to come down and collect a rather large delivery. And there were um, 18 bankers boxes of materials for the mediation and I rang the lawyer and I said to you know, what is this and he said oh that's a complete set of all the papers discovery the whole lot and I explained as mediator I don't need the full newspaper I don't want war and peace the plot summary for war and peace will do me fine once I understand what the issues are um, I don't know what your experience on things like that is Liam. Yeah I've seen mediators um, say you know full-time mediators perhaps foreign mediators being very prescriptive and saying you know I will accept x number of files I will not accept more than two lever arch files or one banker's box or whatever it's not a bad idea you know to focus people's minds but you know a, a solicitor isn't doing their client any service by doing that because you're you're swamping the mediator and you're and you're not being fair to them and, you know, to go back to what you said, Bill, I think in terms of preparation for the mediation, the best thing that you could do is to present the case as clearly and as succinctly as you can, and do a decent position paper, you know, which I think most mediators welcome, where, if you like, in non-legalese pleadings language, in ordinary English instead, you make the claim on behalf of your client and, again, try and make it as intelligible as you can for the mediator. And obviously th that comes from the, the solicitor. In, in your experience, do you like to see counsel involved in mediations or do you prefer to engage with solicitors? I mean, yes and no. I think, I think again, you have to be absolutely, you know, flexible in your approach. And I mean, what I don't believe should happen is that you bring along your full legal team. You have senior counsel and junior counsel. So sometimes I'll bring along one and sometimes I'll bring along none. And it very much depends on the client. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of counsel now are trying to charge full brief fees for mediation, which in some ways defeats the purpose, which is to try and provide a cost effective remedy. Um, one thing, and, and I know a question came in there about it, Justin, is on the settlement agreement. I think that that's something you have to be very careful about that, you know, ultimately, that's what you're trying to achieve, a binding settlement agreement at the end of the mediation, which is just as enforceable as if a court order was made in that you can bring it to court and sue on it. And I've I've had to do that where you've had to, you know, refer a settlement agreement to the court for interpretation. But counsel can have a role there. And certainly, you know, a solicitor involved needs to be very careful that they draft that settlement agreement in a way that's legally enforceable, absolutely clear on its terms and um, not vague in any way, not conditional in any way. Um, that sets out completely all of the um, ingredients that have been agreed. And the mediator would look at that and, you know, approve it. But it's not really, I think, the role of the mediator to, to draft that bill or to, you know, get, get drawn into the minutiae of it. Yeah. And, and then the, question, the question was, is that enforceable? Sorry to come. Absolutely. It, that, is fully, that is fully enforceable. And they are enforced on a regular basis by the courts. 
but only if they're clear on their terms in all respects. And sometimes there can be a, a, an argument as to interpretation or what have you, but that shouldn't arise with a well-drafted settlement agreement. But the section 11 actually says that the parties can decide if it is to be enforceable or not, but the default position is it is enforceable. Yeah. Just like any settlement, if you have straightforward uh, negotiations and a settlement, are you... Yeah, you well, you'd wonder why things. you wouldn't. It's enforceable. Why, why wouldn't you want an enforceable agreement at the end of a successful mediation? I, I've never seen one that was expressed not to be enforceable, I have to say. Listen, guys, we're, we're into the sort of the last minute or so, so we're a little tight for time. So what, the one last question for me anyway is, where would you go to find out more information about mediation? And what, if I... Well, I, I, what I generally do when people contact me about acting as a mediator, I have a pack that I send out to people. And if anybody, without any, having anything in particular in mind, if they're interested, I just send me an email uh, to my email address, bill at hulahanlaw.ie. That's H-O-L-O-H-A-N-L-A-W.ie. I'll ship them out what I send to the solicitors for people who require me about that, possibly acting as a mediator. Uh, and it'll cure insomnia, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> There's a host of, of, of uh, publications, Justin. Uh, you know, it can be approached from a legal angle, a psychological angle, a business angle. I mean, it, it came out of Harvard. There's a very good kind of seminal book called Getting to Yes. And it's just fascinating. I mean, anyone who's interested in, say, politics or current affairs, you know, dispute resolution in its widest sense. Um, a lot has been written about it and, and it is genuinely interesting stuff. So we're, we're just coming up to 1.30 there. So if any final remarks, I suppose next week we're, we're uh, talking to PPC around thinking of hiring trainees and a new sort of hybrid model that they have. So if anyone wants to join us for that, uh, the registration details are online. As I said earlier, the recording will go out later. Thanks to Bill, thanks to Liam, but any final remarks? Just think about it. Uh, absolutely. I would commend it highly to people. And I think like everything, you have to try it. And and I bet once you have, you should have a positive experience and, and see it for what it is. Listen, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Sorry for we're out of time, but a uh, really informative session. Thank you very much. Sloan, have a good Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.